Frank uh, Reynolds. I'd also like to introduce to you, we have a very famous guy here tonight in historic preservation. He just happened to come down with Calder, and his name is Hugh Miller here in the front row. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Hugh Miller is probably one of the most important uh, people, even in America, in historic preservation. So I just thought I'd introduce you to you. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, anyway, Calder, uh, now retired for many years as senior architectural historian for the Virginia Department of uh, Historic Resources, is one of the premier architectural research historians on the East Coast and is known internationally. With both undergraduate and graduate degrees in architectural history from the University of Virginia, he's a frequent uh, lecturer and a member and advisor to many uh, historic boards such as the Center for Palladian Studies in America, which all of you should be a member of, the um, Poplar Forest and the Institute of Classical Architecture, where he has been an instructor in architectural uh, literacy. In addition to many articles in the, on classicism, Calder is the author of and co-author of many books, such as the Virginia Landmarks Register, which I know a lot of you are familiar with, uh, the Virginia Landmarks of Black History, The Making of Virginia Architecture, Lost Virginia, and The Only Proper Style, just to name a few. Craig, then, is one of the up-and-coming, in my opinion, important architectural historians in America. He is curator of the Branch Museum uh, of Architecture and Design in Richmond and a professor of art history at VCU. His PhD dissertation explored Jefferson's role as a designer of the U.S. Capitol, where Craig was a fellow in residence and received scholarships to retrace Jefferson's tours of England, France, and Italy. His most recent uh, uh, essay covering Jefferson's, um, covering Jefferson's uh, influence on public architecture is included in an edited volume called Late in Liberty, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson and the Power of Knowledge. As some of you might remember, uh, my own talk here three years ago, I believe it was now, on a new discovery here at Farmington. Now, Calder and Craig will relate to you a new discovery at Barbersville from their upcoming book, Calder and Craig. Well, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I feel right at home in Charlottesville since I was born in the University Hospital many years ago. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you a project that we are working on um, involving <clears throat> a house, Barbersville. And as we say here, it is a project for the, uh, of the Center of Palladian Studies in America. Center of Palladian Studies in America, CPSA, as some of you might know, was founded a number of years ago by the late Mario de Valmarana, whom I'm sure many of you knew here, um, to promote interest in the influence of this great uh, 16th century architect on America, among other places. Uh, this proposed book that uh, is being sponsored by the CPSA is the second uh, uh, publication of the CPSA. The first one came out several years ago uh, on BREMO, uh, the design and building of BREMO uh, by Peter Hodson, and I worked on this as well. And we say, as you see here, it's in the Mario de Valmarana series. We are trying to uh, perpetuate Mario's contributions to this great uh, subject by naming this uh, publication series after him. So the Barbersville Project will be the second in that series. Well, what about Barbersville? Most of you know it as a ruin, but we don't know an awful lot about Barbersville, and that's the, one of the goals of this study that we're conducting. Most people today know it as a source of some very good wine. But 
ah, this is a prick. But Barbersville is really important as a work of architecture and primarily as a work of the architecture of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was very concerned about the architectural image of this country among his many other pursuits. And he wanted this new nation that he helped found to have great architecture, beginning with the Virginia State Capitol, which established the precedent for using classical architecture for our public buildings. And also was very important because it marked the first time that the Republican form of government was given specific architectural expression. Remember, everywhere else, uh, government buildings were royal palaces, not, as Jefferson wanted here, a temple of democracy. Now, Jefferson was very concerned about the domestic architecture, particularly of the Virginia gentry. Most of the gentry in the 18th century were living in houses that looked something like this, simple Virginia vernacular structures, wooden buildings with a helter-skelter collection of outbuildings around them. As far as Jefferson was concerned, these had very little architectural value. So he wanted to set an example by designing houses, not only for himself, but for his friends. Now, I, and I'm sure many of you were brought up with the notion that all the houses in Virginia were designed by Jefferson, <laughs> and that they were all built by Hessian soldiers, and that they all served as uh, hospitals during the Civil War. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, when it comes right down to it, Jefferson, we have only seven houses in Virginia that we can specifically say were designed by Jefferson or that he had any really sp uh, specific role in. Of course, first was Monticello. And you can see he wanted to set an example with his own house by expressing it with classical architecture the architecture of ancient Rome, which he said was the foundation of the architecture of Western civilization, as opposed to what he saw in Williamsburg, which he just saw, thought it was second-class English, Georgian, provincial architecture. So, one of the first houses to have a really proper classical portico on it, and probably the first house in America ever to have a dome on it. And of course, he designed his retreat, Poplar Forest, a very unusual octagonal house. Jefferson loved octagons. He used them wherever he could. Even the outhouses at Poplar Forest are octagons. <laughs> Probably designed Edgemont. The research is a little sketchy on this, the documentation, but obviously it's a house that has many Jeffersonian characters. And there is a drawing that we can probably say was the design for Edgemont been uh, very heavily restored, but beautifully done. And he designed, we are pretty sure, Woodbury Forest. We don't have any drawings for this. This is the, now the headmaster's home, the residence for Woodbury Forest School. Uh, but he did send drawings to James Madison's brother for the design of this house. And as you can see, it's been very heavily altered over the years. Perhaps Amptill. We know he did drawings for this in Cumberland County. The house wasn't built quite like Jefferson designed it, but it certainly has many Jeffersonian qualities. And of course, the building we're in now, Farmington. And we can certainly see with this that he liked octagons. We have the front part is, consists of a very long octagon. Wonderful house, and I will look forward to learning more about what Missy Cohen and Wade have to say about this as well. Uh, and he designed Barbersville. Barbersville, unfortunately, is a ruin. And again, we're learning that there wasn't a lot known or it hasn't been compiled about Barbersville. Uh, but ruins excite one's imagination. What happened to it? What did it look like originally? What was in, it intended to look like? Who lived here? Uh, what happened to the people? What's happening with it now? What's going on with this place? Um, again, it makes your mind's eye work and your imagination work when you see a ruin. We have very few good ruins, preserved ruins in America. But what we do know, know about Barbersville, so far, a little sketchy, and I, I will summarize. Um, we do know that it was built for this man, James Barber, 
who was so overshadowed by people like Madison and Monroe and Jefferson that, but he's really important. He was a speaker of the House of, of, uh, House of Delegates. He was for many years a senator. He was a governor of Virginia. He was a secretary of war. He was our ambassador to Britain. He helped establish the Virginia Literary Fund, which funded uh, in large part the University of Virginia. And he was very much involved with the community of Orange County, particularly the agricultural community here. This is, portrait was done about uh, seven or about 1808 by uh, St. Memon. St. Memon could make anybody look good. <laughs> and he always gave them beautiful hair. But he, um, he also gave uh, what are very prominent characteristics of Barber. People talked about it, his bushy eyebrows and his very prominent nose. Well, Barber, with the help of his father-in-law, the Barber family settled in Virginia in the 17th century. They came to Orange County in the 18th century. Um, but Barber, with his father-in-law, started amassing a large amount of acreage in the late 18th century, right in the middle of Orange County, and was determined to build a fine mansion there. And as early as around, we're not sure the dates of these buildings, but around 1807 or 1808, he built two dependencies. And we're pretty sure that they were built at the same time. The brickwork and, architect, uh, and architecture is all very consistent with a meat house in between them. This building had a kitchen, still has a kitchen fireplace in it. Uh, but anyway, this served as a temporary residence until they could build their mansion up on the hill dominating this property. Um, but it wasn't until around 1817 that he really began construction of this house. And at that time, he called on his friend Thomas Jefferson to give him a design for it. And this is Jefferson's original drawing for the elevation, which is preserved in Massachusetts Historical Society. And you can see, like Monticello, it has a, a classical pediment on it and it has a dome, and it has a Chinese railing on it. Jefferson never missed an opportunity to use a Chinese railing. <laughs> and it's what we call Jeffersonian Palladian architecture. Jefferson said that the architecture, which he knew through Palladio's famous treatise, Il Quattro Libre, probably the most influential architectural treatise ever written, was the Bible. And he based a lot of his domestic designs on the designs for classical villas uh, designed by Palladio. We see the Villa Amo on the left here. And what do we see on the Villa Amo? A classical portico. That was Palladio's contribution to domestic architecture of adding this motif to a domestic building, a motif that the Romans reserved for temples and public buildings. They didn't put porticos on their houses, but uh, Palladio used this ancient device for domestic works, and it's not a terribly big building, to give uh, a, a dignity of appearance to the structure, to let people know that an important person lived here. And of course, Jefferson picked up on this and couldn't resist adding a portico to anything he designed. <laughs> and you see the two houses are about the same scale, but they have a stately appearance through this classical architecture. Here is the floor plan. Again, not a very big house because most of the service areas were in separate buildings, not like an English country house where everything's all under one roof making it look like a palace. We just spread it all around in this country. But you see, Jefferson loved octagons here. We have porticos on both sides. This room was a very high ceiling room, a dining room, and I don't know if you can read this or not, but it says buffet and sideboard over here. This was the master bedroom, and it has this space here which says closet. I turned this upside down so it's properly oriented. And then we have a big hall, just like Monticello, recessed in from the portico. Two smaller rooms on either side, that probably bedrooms. And upstairs, we don't know whether these are actually built, but he's showing alcove beds, these beds set in the wall, thing that he admired in France. And then these place these objects here where the fireplaces are, indicating that they were to be uh, Franklin stoves. We're not sure that they were ever put in there, but that's what Jefferson specified. And we have Jefferson's specifications for this, mostly dealing with the number of bricks and uh, the widths of the doors and all that sort of thing. Um, but not a whole lot about the interior of the building. 
let's see, ah, ah, get back, come on, there we are. Uh, about all we know about Jefferson's involvement with the interior is he says, and I've extracted this from that page, he says, I would recommend that the octagon room, the parlor, to have an ionic modillion cornice and the dining room an ionic uh, a dental cornice. These being easily made and, what does it say? Yielding. Yielding none to beauty. So here is the dental cornice with the projections looking just like teeth. That's where the term comes from. Here is the medallion cornice with larger brackets here. So that's about all we know about uh, what Jefferson wanted for interior decoration. I assume that with these cornices, he wanted an, a full entablature, meaning below the cornice there was to be a band, a frieze, and then a series of moldings called the architrave. And it probably would look something like this. So you have up here the modillion cornice with the frieze and extra moldings here, architrave. Uh, this is at Brimo uh, with a full entablature here with a room that has the ceilings about the same height as, uh, 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 as Barbersville had. Uh, please excuse the peeling paint. Uh, this is the original paint. Things don't change at Brimo. Uh, this, it was painted once, and this is not going to be painted again. So that's the way they like it. That's what they specified. Now, Jefferson also, as I said, included a dome on his building. And we're going to hear more about the dome in a minute. But he says the dome may be omitted Help me, Craig. All together, if desired. Well, the, the builders for Barbersville had never worked on a Jeffersonian building, and maybe Jefferson was not sure that they knew how to build a dome, even though he had instructions for it. We also have in the um, Barber papers at the University of Virginia two pages of specifications uh, or estimates in Barber's own hand, which is very important to have. And on that, one of those pages, we have identified the two builders, main builders for Barbersville, a man named Edward Ansel, the bricklayer, and a man named James Bradley, the carpenter. And as near as we know, neither had ever worked on a Jefferson building before. We need to find more information about these guys, as we know next to nothing about them so far. But on the, specific, on the uh, estimates on the other page, we do have a name outlined here, Thomas Whitelaw. We do know something about Thomas Whitelaw. He was a resident of Orange County. He was a contractor, and he supplied building materials, and we know that he was one of the chief builders, contractors, for Brimo down in Fluvanna County. Uh, probably the purest example of Jeffersonian Palladianism, not designed by Jefferson, but designed by Jefferson's chief builder, uh, John Nielsen. And we know specifically that uh, Thomas Whitelaw built the great Palladian stone barn at Brimo with a portico, maybe the only barn in America with a classical <laughs> portico on it. Sadly, we only have four so far known historic images of Barbersville before it burned. The first is this one that appeared in a book published in 1907 on the history of Orange County. If anybody knows where the original watercolor of this is, please let us know. It's a view of the north side, the entrance front. We see the fence outlining the big green sward in, out in front of the building, which was a race course, and we've got, even got a horse there. And then we have on either side of it two stoops, one leading down to the kitchen and the other outbuildings, one leading down to a very large, impressive garden there. Then we have this watercolor here, recently discovered. Uh, we knew about this through a very faded, dark, gloomy, fuzzy photograph in the archives of the uh, University of Virginia here. Didn't tell us much. Then I found another photograph of this just recently in the Virginia Historical Society, and on the back of it it said this photograph was given by somebody named Jane Nelson. I said, well, I know Jane Nelson. I'm going to call her up to a friend of mine. And she said, yes. She said, I'm kin to the Barbers, and uh, a cousin uh, gave me this color photograph of the painting. 
oh, where is this painting? She said, well, it's owned by another cousin. He has it in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, anyway, the photograph, the color photograph is good enough to use. I've contacted the owner in Alaska, and I want to see if it's signed and get the dimensions and all of that. This is a very important document. It is the only known pre-fire illustration of Barbersville before, of the south side before it burned. Let's look at a close-up of the house here. Shows us a number of things. Shows the octagonal projection here. Shows nice, uh, probably orange trees in, in boxed um, containers here, which were probably taken into the greenhouse, which no longer exists here. In the background, these no longer exist, a cluster of buildings which may have been slave quarters. And then, of course, we have the dependencies here. I showed a black and white image. Uh, sophisticated in their own way. Uh, really meant as support ancillary structures, architecturally sophisticated ones for the main house. Then this appeared in the Barber Papers at the University of Virginia. No identification on it whatsoever, probably done uh, shortly before the fire. Um, let's look at a close-up of this, but it shows the other side of those dependencies with their very sophisticated brickwork. The windows set in uh, recessed arches here. And it shows by that time the side stoops had been enclosed with porches here on either side. And it shows ivy growing up the wall, and it shows ivy growing up the columns. And it shows an earth ramp leading up to the front door. And this is very consistent with the only known photograph of Barbersville pre-fire, which is in the Valentine Museum in the Lancaster Collection. Um, but it shows these same enclosed porches on either side, the earth ramp. And here, I've got a close up in a minute. But it does show ivy all over this side and ivy creeping up the columns, just as we saw on that drawing. Here is a close-up of that, and we see the earth ramp. And this still exists with a cobble path in the center of it, and we're not sure if these are wooden boards uh, lining the edges of that or not. We want to do a little more investigation on that. But those are the only four surviving images so far that we know of pre-fire. Sadly, on December 25th, Christmas Day Eve, Barbersville burned. This is the best I could do photoshopping a fire on the, on the, of the ruins. And um, few things were salvaged from the fire. Some bits and pieces of china, which are on display at Barbersville Vineyards today. These were given by one of the descendants who lives in New York City. Nice pieces of French porcelain is white with Barber's initials, James Barber, J.B. on them. They have a number of pieces of this. And some of this, which is just about the finest quality French porcelain you could have at the time. So it shows that Barber was living very well at Barbersville. There is supposedly one chest of drawers that was salvaged from the fire that's in Philadelphia, and the descendant who owns it is going to send me a photograph of it. I haven't seen it yet. So after that, Barbersville ruin fell into a long period of decline. It just started getting enshrouded with vines and trees and all sorts of things till it became almost invisible, just a great big bush with only the columns showing. The family lived here, the uh, descendants moved to the dependencies in, uh, after the fire and lived there until about 1947, <laughs> living here. And then it was, well, this shows the dependencies in the 1940s. Here is the meat house in between, which by, probably was roofless by then, because you can see daylight coming through the front door with the ramshackle uh, balcony connecting the two porticos. And when it was turned into the permanent residence, at some time in the late 19th or maybe early 20th century, this portico was added. and this rickety bridge was leading over to the second part. And we see some interesting racking or holes on the side here as if a wall or another building was to be put on this, this end, but that was never done. So uh, I first saw Barbersville in 1969. By then it was owned by Mr. and Mrs. Smithers, who had cleaned it up pretty much, but the ruins were still not in stable condition. Ah, oh, I went too far. All right. 
There we go. The big break for Barbersville came in 1976 when Mario de Valmarana convinced Italian friends of his, the Zonins, who were great vintners, to purchase this because he felt this would be a good place to establish a Virginia wine industry, which Jefferson has tried to establish but failed in the early 19th century. And he also supervised the stabilization of the ruin. Now, Mario, of course, had he could identify with Barbersville because his family uh, owned Palladio's most famous work of architecture, his most famous house, the Villa Rotunda. His family still owns it. And uh, if you compare Barbersville with the Villa Rotunda, there are certain similarities. They both have low domes, they both have porticos. Um, uh, so Mario could relate to this. He understood it. He understood what Jefferson was trying to say with this Jeffersonian inter or this Palladian interpretation. So here are the ruins being stabilized, uh, the brick walls being capped. It's very important to do that on brick ruins. They're very subject to deterioration if you don't get the water off the top of the walls. The uh, dependencies were beautifully restored. I don't know if any of you have seen them. They wonderful interiors as only the Italians can do now. They serve as guest houses and you can, can rent them. Here they are um, handsomely done. Um, and uh, one little thing I wanted to see if I can persuade Barbersville Vineyards to do. If you look here on the columns, you see at one time they had capitals. Well, they don't have capitals now. And they need capitals. They look kind of like stovepipes now. We need to restore that little architectural refinement to these buildings. And you can see how they follow the curve of the race course out front here. It's been speculated that he was going to add additional dependencies on this side, matching, but they were never done. I don't know. There is, on that other side, a very elaborate, the bones of a very elaborate garden, which you'll see on the uh, site visit there. So. This is the way Barbersville looks today, stabilized. The columns are tied together with steel rods up here, thank goodness, to keep them from falling over. And it is beautifully nestled in the beautiful Orange County um, countryside here. There are no plans to reconstruct Barbersville like Poplar Forest or, or work going on in the rotunda. There are an, a wonderful ruin that excite the imagination. But, we're going to hear a little bit more about Barbersville from my colleague Craig Reynolds because this isn't the whole story. This is just sort of what we know about Barbersville now, but some new information has turned up that leads to all sorts of speculation on the evolution of the design. It maybe just didn't spring right out of the head of Thomas Jefferson immediately, but has a more interesting story behind it. So I will invite Craig to come up and take over right now. Thank you, Calder. Um, I was not born in the local hospital. Um, even though I'm a Richmonder, the good folks of Albemarle County have always been gracious in, in inviting me here to share uh, my research, and so I thank all of you tonight for having me here. And uh, as Calder has alluded, uh, what we once accepted as uh, nothing more than ruins we now know to, uh, to be a great deal more important in understanding not just Barbersville as a particular work of Jefferson, but in telling the fuller story of Jefferson's hand in directing domestic design in Virginia. And the real break for us in our investigation is, whoops, is this portrait. Can you guess who this man is? He has a very particular profile, nose, eyebrows, of course, James Barber. This portrait has never been published. It's been little seen. It's never been researched until just a couple of years ago. 
we don't know the full story of this portrait. It evidently passed through several hands. It obviously survived the fire that destroyed Barbersville. And uh, it suddenly came to light through an auction in New Orleans, Louisiana, of all places. Now owned by an alum of the University of Virginia, you can presently see this portrait on exhibit at the Freyland Museum at the University of Virginia. So I'm showing you the facsimile. You can go see the real thing just a few miles down the road. <clears throat> and as I said, this really becomes uh, a wedge that allows us to, to it really explore what the heck is going on with Jefferson's ideas for Barbersville. Um, as you can see, Aside from Mr. Barber, there are two uh, architectural references in this portrait. Uh, to his left shoulder, you see the elevation of a house. And in his right hand, he holds a scroll of paper, which has an architectural drawing on it. The artist who completed this portrait, a man named Cephas Thompson, not a Virginian, but we'll forgive him. I'm not a Virginian either. Cephas Thompson, uh, uh, one of the most important early American portrait painters uh, from Massachusetts. And he did a circuit of the South. And when he came to Virginia, like he did in Maryland and Pennsylvania, he painted all, he painted portraits of all of the leading uh, members of the Virginia gentry. And this was painted at about the time that Barber B. Uh, rose to power politically. This is just before he moves into the governor's mansion in Virginia. He's, of course, the first governor to live in the governor's mansion. Um, perhaps this portrait hung in the governor's mansion. We, we, Unfortunately, don't know that. But what's striking about this portrait is uh, not necessarily in its similarities, but it's, it's in the differences as compared to other Cephas Thompson portraits. Here's another very important Virginian painted by Cephas Thompson, a man named John Nivison. And John Nivison was a partner with uh, George Washington. They went in on the uh, uh, dismal swamp development. Unfortunately, that was a failure. He was a, uh, a leader in uh, Norfolk, uh, an attorney, a financial backer of the American Revolution, uh, a major leader in early Virginia. But what do you see? The, aside from the clear anatomical features of the sitter, there's not much else there that's grabbing our attention. Cephas Thompson was known for uh, providing backgrounds that were rather nebulous, cloud-like, generic, to use a sort of modern term. The same can be said for his portrait of another important Virginian, John Marshall. Again, the focus, and I think one of the reasons that Cephas Thompson was so popular and became such an important uh, portrait artist in the early 19th century, was his skill and ability at capturing the true likeness of the sitter. Uh, without any emphasis or attention on any of the background or any of the trappings around them. And we'll talk a little bit more um, a, a, about why that may be, especially in the early 19th century. So the portrait of, of James Barber really is extraordinarily different. It's not only an extraordinary portrait, it's extraordinarily different than the entire portfolio of Cephas Thompson paintings we know to survive. Now what's interesting here is that Cephas Thompson kept a very detailed account, a ledger. We knew that he painted a portrait of James Barber. No one knew where that portrait was. And of course, since Barbersville burned, it was long assumed that the portrait was lost as part of that fire. So what a treasure to now have this portrait, not only to shed more light on Cephas Thompson as an important American artist, as James Barber, an important early Virginian, 
but also to tell the story more fully of Barbersville as an important early American house designed by one of the most important American architects, Thomas Jefferson. As I said, there are two key architectural elements in this portrait. Now, I've just told you that one of the important elements here is how it's different than all of Cephas Thompson's other portraits. That's not to say that portraits did not include architectural elements in them. I show you my, if I may add my own personal taste, my most favorite portrait of Thomas Jefferson, this one, his last life portrait, done in retirement in about 1821 or so, we see Thomas Jefferson standing alongside an architectural feature, a column. And we all know, as Calder has just pointed out, one of Jefferson's most favorite architectural elements were the, the orders, the architectural orders based on Roman antiquity. Uh, and we see here Thomas Jefferson standing uh, alongside this column, this portrait by uh, another important early American portrait painter, Sully, Thomas Sully. And Sully, and, uh, as a side note, Sully actually visited Monticello, painted, this, uh, painted portraits from life um, of Jefferson. This portrait was in intended for uh, the Military Academy at West Point, where it, it still lives to this very day, a portrait of, of the founder of West Point Military Academy. And it's not that architectural elements are meant to be generic stand-ins either. That's another important point for me to point out. It, part of the, the lost understanding of this portrait is that it had long been assumed that that column was meaningless. It was just a stand-in. It was a visual tool used by the artist. And that's simply not the case. In fact, this is a very important column a very specific column, a column that Thomas Jefferson had a hand in designing. He and his partner, B. Henry, Henry Latrobe, the first sort of national architect, he was uh, one of the primary architects of the United States Capitol. In fact, what we're looking at here is the rebuilt House of Representatives as built after the British burned it in 1814. And we see the match between the column as illustrated in the portrait, and the column that survives today in the United States Capitol. Thomas Jefferson was very proud of this accomplishment and proud of, of this work of architecture as a testament to uh, American ingenuity and artistic ability um, in its coming of age as a robust democratic republican society. Here we are in the space which was the heart of that, the space where the representatives of the people met. And it needed an appropriate architectural setting for that. No wonder it shows up in the portrait. So are we looking at something similar with James Barber? Now, what we're seeing here, though, is the vision of Barbersville. At least that's our interpretation right now, because this portrait was made before the foundation of the house was dug before bricks were ever made. And there's, uh, I have to admit, we don't quite fully understand yet the chronology of the design. And I'll go into a little more detail about that as well. Let's start with what Jefferson was saying about architecture. He, in many ways, is the first reformer of architecture in America. And I would say, as someone who has spent a great deal of time studying architecture, what he was doing as a critic of architecture is as important as what he was doing in designing. Uh, his criticisms, what he was writing, the way he was influencing his friends and leaders was as important because James Barber, like many other leaders in America, not just in Virginia, were paying attention. They were heeding what Jefferson was saying. In a letter to James Madison, Jefferson writes, quote, but how is a taste in this beautiful art, that's architecture, to be formed in our countrymen unless we avail ourselves of every occasion when public buildings are to be erected, 
of presenting models for study and imitation, end quote. One of his primary methods of reforming Americans' taste in architecture was to establish models. How did Americans build in the 18th and 19th century? They did it by looking at other buildings, at extant structures. And Jefferson didn't want buildings being built after these wooden shanty towns that he knew from Williamsburg. When we build buildings, we should build them for permanence, and they should be built as models to influence our fellow countrymen. As governor, and in living in the governor's palace in Williamsburg, and his quote in notes from the state of Virginia, he talks about the governor's mansion, the governor's palace in Williamsburg, calling it, quote, not handsome, but capable of being made an elegant seat, end quote. This supposedly is the premier residence in Virginia, and we have Jefferson condemning it. But we know what he meant by being, it has some capability. He made a plan of this building, and what did he want to do? Add a monumental <laughs> portico in the front, a monumental portico in the back, and if that weren't enough columns for you, colonnaded wings on either side. In essence, what we get is a Roman temple as the nucleus, colonnaded wings, very similar to what we see at the University of Virginia Academical Village. But of course, oh, he hated anything that broke that roof line. He called things like cupolas, quote, one of the great degeneracies of modern architecture, end quote. So of course we've got to lop that off too. This is a radical transformation of what Virginians not only knew from everyday life, but what they accepted as the height of architectural taste. So let's now return to our portrait as a, as a, as a view into how can we learn about Barbersville? Let's turn first to the scroll of paper that he has in his hand. Here's a close-up view. I'm going to rotate it just so that we can better see what's on that paper. Barber is showing us an ionic column capital. Now I have to admit we haven't made much of this just yet but I think quite telling that Barber is not only demonstrating an architectural feature in the background, but in his hand is holding a work, a drawing. And that drawing isn't of the governor's palace, that drawing is of a classical feature from ancient Rome. The exact model that Jefferson was calling for Virginians to look to and follow. Let's now look to that elevation that's in the back. It looks very close to the Villa Rotunda, as, as Calder has pointed out, Palladio's most famous building. Now, Jefferson never visited the Villa Rotunda. He knew the Villa Rotunda through illustrations, through published works, and I'm showing you an illustration from Jefferson's principal source. That's Palladio as reworked by Giacomo Leone. This is an illustration which Jefferson not only used himself, but uh, he advertised, he shared with others. He, in fact, even lobbied George Washington to have the federal government pay to have these images reproduced and then distributed for free so that Americans would know what good architecture is. And he was very afraid as Washington, D.C. was being developed that we would get another Williamsburg. He wanted little Villa Rotundas filling Washington, D.C. So let's look at a close-up of that architectural detail in the back. Here we see it. I'm going to duplicate it and flip it and then we'll just fill it in with a few lines just to give us an idea of what might we be looking at. And again, it becomes even 
a, an even stronger connection to the Villa Rotunda form that Jefferson advocated, that Jefferson loved. Now what's interesting about this architectural feature in the back is on closer examination, we can see that there is pencil underline drawing here. Uh, and then that leads us to the next question, is Cephas Thompson getting help with his architectural rendering? Cephas Thompson is a portrait painter, not an architect. Um, we don't know the answer to that question yet, but it's another interesting layer in the story here of the evolution of the design of Barbersville. Oops. It's also um, important to understand the significance of what Jefferson called the Rotunda House, the sort of variation on the Villa Rotunda, in his mind as the premier <laughs> domestic architectural form that Americans should be using. I show you here an architectural exercise, a drawing exercise uh, delineated by Robert Mills. Robert Mills was among the first professional, native-born professional architects working in the United States. <clears throat> he uh, worked directly with Thomas Jefferson and directly with uh, B. Henry Latrobe. Uh, this drawing was executed in Washington when Jefferson was president and probably executed at the White House, in fact. I know that Robert Mills had access to Jefferson's copies of Palladio because Jefferson bragged to all of his, his Washington friends that he brought copies of Palladio to the nation's capital and he was the first to do it. And of course, Jefferson ordered copies of Palladio for the Library of Congress. So we know that Jefferson was advertising the use of Palladio in Washington and we see here a sort of variation on the Villa Rotunda. And here we see, I call it a variation because this is Jefferson's idea for a simplified American version. What Jefferson wanted as a magistrate's house. So American officials, diplomats, uh, governors, uh, if the public is providing a residence for those officials, this is what it should look like. It should follow this model. And we know that Jefferson, in fact, took this plan and elevation that Robert Mills created, and he was parading it around Congress, right? You should allocate money for the funding of this building. I don't have the drawing for you because it's actually a rather lousy drawing. It's deteriorated quite a bit, but we can use this as, as a model. Jefferson so loved this that this is what he proposed for the president's house. This is not what he got, but this is what he wanted for the president's house. Whoops. If we stick with Robert Mills, we get another layer of both questions and answers to deal with. As I told you there, the portrait illustrates that there is some pencil delineation, underdrawing. And when we compare the elevation in the portrait to other works by Robert Mills, we see some striking similarities. I show you here the lost Alexandria Courthouse by Robert Mills. And let me give you a side-by-side -side comparison of the elevation by Robert Mills on the left and the elevation in the portrait. We're currently ascribing to Cephas Thompson, but again, we have to ask the question, was, what was Cephas Thompson looking at? What was his source? Did he have assistance with this architectural elevation? Again, Cephas Thompson was not a designer of architecture. We can also look to Robert Mills' surviving custom house in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Again, looking at a side-by-side -side comparison, the similarities are striking, so much so that we can't ignore the possibility that there is some connection, not just with Thomas Jefferson as a designer of Farmington, but perhaps one of Jefferson's protégés, Robert Mills. And of course, this is what Jefferson was advocating not just that uh, models would be set for Americans to follow, but Americans would be trained properly 
in the architectural arts, and that when they were executing designs, of course, they were following this classical tradition. And so I bring us back around to the portrait as a manner of conclusion. What I've shared with you and what Calder has shared with you today uh, is a snapshot only of what we have uh, explored, both questions uh, and answers thus far. And um, I will tell you that there are many more answers to come because now with the portrait as this a uh, truly important, unparalleled window into the history of the development of Barbersville. And not just Barbersville as a building, but the art of architectural drawing and the development of architecture as a profession in America is hugely important. Um, and so with that, I will um, uh, turn it over to Ed. And I think we have a little, okay, I'll turn it over and let you, thank you. I think you can uh, really tell the depth and, and that people go into for architectural research just from this wonderful talk. Isn't that amazing? Just amazing, really. Uh, what all goes into just discovering things like this. It's a lifetime event. <laughs> uh, we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions and so on, but before you do that, I just want to mention one little thing, if I may. Um, both Calder and I are on the board of the uh, uh, Center for Planning Studies in America, and we've been talking about Andrea Palladio, born in six, uh, 1508 and died in 1580. Any rate, that particular organization has now been, uh, which was uh, established by Mario de Valmarana in 1979, is now moved to the architecture school at the university. And we have as our president, uh, uh, Mr. Borscher, who is the uh, director of the Friday Museum. So I hope all of you can maybe join us sometime for tours. We just did tours this last year of Albemarle County's private homes. We did tours also of, uh, of Orange County homes. And next year, in April, we'll be going for two and a half days, or two days, to uh, Clark County. Extraordinary houses above Winchester uh, that will be private homes. And also we'll be going to the Scotland uh, in uh, June. Any anyway, so any questions for these two before we, we have about 10 minutes, that's about all. Uh, oh, yes, the most important thing, I forgot. Uh, Cole, just remind me. You're all invited to a very free symposium at the Architecture School sponsored by the Center for Play and Studies in America, and it's uh, on Saturday, October the 10th. And um, all of you are invited, it's free. It starts at 8.15 and ends at 4.30. There's extraordinary speakers, called it only one of them, but many. And also there's a tour, uh, a special tour, of the rotunda under construction and so on that day. So anyway, all of you are invited to that particular thing. You need to sign up online and sign up there. That's all, 100% of the plating steps. Are there any questions okay. for our speakers? Uh, I think there is some American bond on, on secondary walls, but, but the, the main uh, elevations are, are Flemish bond. Very nice Flemish bond on the house itself, and it's uh, typical of Flemish bond of that period. It has pencil joints, meaning that all the uh, 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 mortar joints are painted with a thin white line to make them look like more expensive brick than they really are. <laughs> but you see that on, on most of the Jeffersonian buildings. Too. Yeah, you have it here, okay, and the university as well. Another question, yes. I'd be interested to know how you became aware of the existence of this painting, how it came to be, uh, and, and that you were aware of it. Well, uh, it, there was notice of it when it was came up at auction, right. and I know that the uh, governor's mansion in Richmond wanted to buy it, but they were outbid by the current owner. 
And I didn't know who owned it until I took a tour about a year ago of the owner's house, and there was the painting hanging in the library. And I said, oh, you got it. He oh. said, yes, I did. <laughs> so, anyway, that led to long discussions and uh, uh, what, what all of this meant. And um, so he was very interested in having the story explored and published, and he is one of the sponsors of this publication. Who is the owner? Uh, uh, Jim Murray. Most of you know Jim Murray, I, I trust, all right. Yes, sir. You mentioned that the plans you were in the Massachusetts Historical Society. I'm curious how they ended up there. <laughs> you want to do that? Or, or? Uh, essentially, to make a long story short, it's uh, because of a Jefferson descendants, um, the Coolidge, but basically it passed through the Coolidges. And in 18, I forget the year, but uh, essentially in the 19th century, this entire collection uh, of both, it was, a, it was a, an entire collection of documents, not just in Jefferson's hand, uh, that included letters, drawings, notations, uh, that came to the Massachusetts Historical Society as a uh, entire collection. Uh, among all of these documents is both the the drawings for Barbersville, as well as that uh, sheet of specifications. And the drawings for Farmington. Yeah. Exactly. Among <laughs> men at Monticello, um, there are drawings from um, uh, some Richmond projects, Governor's Mansion, uh, many projects that Jefferson proposed for Washington, D.C. It's, 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 uh, and all of those drawings, not the letters or, or even some of the notations, but at least all the major drawings have been digitized. And you can look at them for yourselves on the Massachusetts Historical Society website. What happened is this whole collection of Jefferson papers, including the drawings, were inherited by his grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph. And sometime in the mid-19th or maybe after the Civil War, the rich cousins, uh, the Coolidges, who are also direct descendants of Thomas Jefferson from one of his daughters, uh, bought the collection from uh, Thomas Jefferson Randolph. And by the late 19th century, we're looking around for a proper repository for them, some place that could take care of them. So maybe they didn't trust the rotunda, and probably just as well because the rotunda burned. Uh, and I don't think the, the Library of Virginia was collecting that sort of thing at the time. It was mainly state papers at the time. So uh, trusting in their own institutions, they gave them to the uh, Massachusetts Historical Society, where they are very carefully preserved. We even had to be photographed before we could look at them. So. <laughs> but they were very nice in bringing them out and letting us look at them for several hours and examine them, because they're just things you cannot see in reproductions of drawings. You have to look at the originals, and we found all sorts of little interesting things on those drawings. Let's please thank our all speaker. Right. And we have a little gift for our speakers, uh, for Ed, who has um, been here before. We have yeah. one of our wonderful History Society tote bags that we'd like. Available for purchase. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for Calder and for Craig, we have, um, I hope you don't already have this, we have the 2000. No, we don't. Board, okay, and we have the, uh, the quarters. Okay. Too, the uh, dependencies. Uh, and, of course, put by your bedside to dream of Farmington. We've got a little <laughs> wooden replica. I think I have to take it out. So, <laughs> there you go. So, Very this nice. is our Thanks. way of thanking you. And, I need a tote easy. bed, man. Well, bag. Mine is nice very warm. Tote bag and, uh, here you so, go. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.